Hey guys, Steve Brown from Secondhand Horology. Secondhandhorology.com. Just wanted to take a moment to discuss something that I think is super cool, um, and that is chronometers as well as the predecessor to what we know as the modern chronometer, and that is the American Railroad Watch, which more or less set the timekeeping standards for the entire world. So, as our nation began to industrialize and railroads really, really started to take over industry, basically leading to the American Industrial Revolution, um, a need arose, and the, the need was accurate timekeeping, um, because you had a lot of trains on a lot of tracks, and if you, if you know anything about trains, they're very heavy. Uh, they carry precious cargo. Sometimes that precious cargo is human lives. Sometimes it's valuable uh, products and tools and raw steel or whatever the case may be to really, really bring the nation to the point uh, where, where, it, where it is now, right? And that foundation was laid by the American Railroad. One of the problems, though, was that there was no real standardization of time. There are other videos uh, and more literature you can read to learn more about this one specific fact, but this is where it gets real crazy. At one point in time, railroads, each individual station or stop had its own clock, right? And the clock was actually used by, uh, or actually timed by the position of the sun in the sky, much like a sundial. So, for example, if you had one station that was 20 miles to the east of the other station, their clock might say 12 at high noon, right? But if you're 20, 30 miles to the west of that location, you're not going to be at high noon due to the meridian, of the, the meridian lines of the earth. So, having said that, there was discrepancy from the very beginning. Um, one station's 12 was another station's 11.45, right? So it became very, very obvious very quickly early on in the days of the railroad that timekeeping was extraordinarily important. There were many different railroad companies in the United States of America, especially from essentially St. Louis to the east. Um, and, and each individual railroad was privately owned, and there was no there was no regulation among the railroads. So having said that, each railroad company had its own timekeeping standards. Uh, very important stuff because you have you have switching of tracks, you have split routes of tracks, and it's very easy to have an accident because there were so many trains running and very tight tight uh, time intervals that if one conductor's train or watch was off by just a few moments, what would happen is you'd have a collision of two trains and it'd be very costly, very deadly. You would lose time, energy, the tracks would have to re be repaired, so on and so forth. So at that point in time, American pocket watches were pretty much the standard. They were ahead of the Swiss in terms of manufacturing ability and availability, and for the most part, they were pretty accurate. However, it was just considered, the kind of the rules were, up until a certain point, and that point was 1860, was just that you had to have a watch, it had to be a higher quality watch, and it had to keep relatively good time, right? So you would sync it to your home station's clock, and that was that. So, this was not necessarily a good thing, and there were a lot of railroad disasters. And if you do a little Google homework, you'll find that this was actually very common. Uh, very common front page news stories, like terrible, terrible, horrendous accidents, okay, that involved loss of human lives, uh, slowed down the entire process. It was just a bad deal. Uh, so in 1860, I have to refer to my notes here because I made some notes for you guys. In 1860, the Pennsylvania Railroad actually commissioned a, a little watch company of the Midwest called Elgin. Uh, they commissioned Elgin to build a standardized 
Railroad pocket watch, okay? And this watch, the specifications that they gave, and there weren't many, was that it had to be an 18 size, that is the caliber, that is the size of the watch, it had to be an 18 size. It had to be key wind and key set. So you couldn't pull a stem of a watch and wind it or pull the stem of a watch and set the time. You actually had to open up the back and use a key to set the time and a key to set the, um, to wind the movement. And the reason for this was because they didn't want any type of, um, any, any, any type, type of interference. So it's in a jacket, it's being pulled out. Whoops, I bumped the time. Whoops, now we have a railroad accident, okay? Another interesting part is that, you know, at the time, what we call keyless set, right? So the setting of us through a stem and pulling out the stem to set the time, that really wasn't invented yet, or if it was invented, it really wasn't widely in production, right? So key wind, key set, 18 size, 15 joule. Those were the parameters set by the Pennsylvania Railroad when they contacted Elgin. Elgin said, heck yeah, we'll make that watch. Um, <clears throat> they produced that watch, and actually they named it after, after its founder, uh, B.W. Raymond. So B.W. Raymond was the former mayor of Chicago and also the chief primary founding member of Elgin Watch Company. So from that point forward, that kind of served as the benchmark. That watch more or less served as the benchmark against what all other watches were judged. A number of other manufacturers started to make railroad watches. Um, Waltham, for example, did. Uh, Hamilton, Illinois uh, did. And I actually have examples of three of those here on the table. So these are the examples that we have on hand today, as well as the B.W. Raymond wrist chronometer, which was actually the first mechanical watch ever approved for use by the railroads. We'll talk about that more in detail later. So back in 1860, we talked about the B.W. Raymond being commissioned and, and made. Another of other manufacturers got involved, like I said, like Hamilton and Waltham and Illinois, etc. Um, and then, more or less, it was still kind of like the Wild West. Every railroad got to have their own standards for timekeeping until in 1891, there was a horrific train accident uh, where a number of people lost their lives. Now, a guy was reading the newspaper. His name was Webb C. Ball. And Mr. Ball was a jeweler. And he actually happened to um, be greatly disturbed by this story. Uh, so he kind of took it upon himself to basically create a set of standards of which a railroad watch should have, um, such as consistent timekeeping in various positions. Um, and then he, he lobbied very, very hard and long um, to get there to be a nationally adopted program in which railroad watches um, where there was uniformity among the railroads to adopt timekeeping standards. It didn't really catch on at first. Uh, in fact, in 1892, Illinois Central Railroad uh, was the first railroad company to actually implement a watch inspection process. And so in doing so, Illinois Watch Company made conductors, engineers, firemen, etc., anybody who had con major control over the actual train's operation, they made them submit their watch quarterly for an examination. Uh, and they actually employed a whole team of people to examine these watches. Okay. In addition to the, the quarterly examination, they had individuals who on a weekly basis would check conductors, engineers, whatever, they would conduct, they would check their watches against the standardized company clock, okay? So this was their job. 
it became very, very important to them. Um, jumping forward a few years, around 1893, railroad watches had better definitions, but they were still pretty broad. Um, and most of the railroads started to adopt these standards uniformly. And it was that they were, had to be size 18 or 16. Both of these watches here are size 16 watches, okay? Uh, they had to be 16 or 18 size. They had to be 17 jewels. And they had to be accurate to minus or plus 30 seconds per week. They also had to be adjusted to temperature. So they had to maintain this accuracy from 34 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They had to have a double roller. They had to have a steel escape lever. They had to have micro regulators, which if you look at the regulator on this Hamilton 992B right here, you will see that there are what's called a micro regulator. There are little tiny fine screws for ultra precise regulation of that timepiece okay they had to have a they had to be stem wound and they had to have the grade of the watch clearly labeled on the back of the watch so again if we look at this hamilton we will actually see that the grade of the watch is in fact clearly marked on the back of it as 992b this is a more modern uh watch. Having said that, the other parameters were that you had to have a white dial, you had to have bold black numerals, and you had to have bold black hands. Um, we say black, that's kind of a, a loosely used term because the actual hands are made of tempered blue steel. Uh, they're super dark, but they are technically blue, but those were the standards set forth by the railroads. So things are starting to get a little bit more precise. And eventually, and continuously, I should say, improvements were made. So moving on to higher jewel counts, moving on to tighter tolerances. So by the year 1900, all of the same parameters, double roller, etc., they had to have sapphire pallets, okay? So this was another improvement. And they had to be adjusted to five positions as well as temperature. So I actually have here a chart that shows the positions of which the watches had to be adjusted, if you guys like to see it. So guys, I'm gonna show you some of the positions and actually I'm gonna to have to jump ahead into the future a little bit. I'll explain why. But having said that, this is a, a phenomenal book. And if you don't have one of these, I strongly, strongly recommend you get one. Uh, this is what's known in the watch community as the Bible. Um, and that's because it is an absolute, absolute wealth of information. So I think the last year they produced this was 2019. I could be wrong on that. It doesn't matter. Hunt one down, find one, go to YouTube, go to Amazon, get one. Because I promise you, no matter what your level is of, of knowledge and, and, and of skill and history in this world of, of watches, this thing is going to have something in there that you did not know. And it's going to provide you with more insight and more knowledge than you previously had. So find one. It's the complete guide to watches price guide to watches. Um, they're amazing. So jumping forward, I'm going to show you when we talked about positions earlier, I'm going to show you the latest. So this was the, this would have been the 1965 version of adjustments. Um, but having said that much remains the same. So here we go, guys. When they we talk about accuracy and timekeeping accuracy at different positions, this is quite simply what we mean. So they measured the watch in the position of stem up, right? So vertically stem up. Then they checked the accuracy, stem down. Stem left, right? Stem right, dial up, and dial down. 
Now I can't say for sure because I do not know when they were only when they were only adjusting to five positions. I'm not sure which one they left out. I think it was probably this one. This position adjustment not required for railroad watches. So this is the one um, at that point in time that they were not using. It would have been the stem down or crown down version. Um, Many of them later went on to, even though it wasn't required, they went on to actually do that. So in addition to, in addition to having all of these positions, they also threw in another requirement, and that was something called isochronism. What in the world does that mean? What is isochronism? So if you look at mini watches, uh, especially higher grade pieces, they will say adjusted to X amount of positions, heat, cold, and isochronism. It'll say it right there on the movement. Isochronism is actually a really, really great thing. So what that means, your mainspring, if you've ever played with a spring of any kind before, maybe you've never worked on a watch, but you've played with a spring at some point in time. As a spring becomes more compressed, right what happens it builds more pressure as a spring becomes less compressed it decreases the amount of pressure that it actually has so what that means in the world of watches previously to adjusting for isochronism it meant that when your watch was fully wound it was at its most accurate because all of the torque was really really just pounding down on the gear train and was allowing that balance wheel to have the proper amplitude that it needed to in order to remain accurate. So as the watch winds down though, so maybe it's got 20% power left, if a watch is not adjusted for isochronism, then this, act this watch actually starts to become less accurate. So if you're really curious about adjusting for isochronism, you can do a Google search. I'll kind of I'll kind of break it down real quick. There is more to it that I'm not going to mention, but part of it is building a hairspring, right? Building a hairspring that has that that is as equal pressure whether it's bound up, so it's on the it's on the in sweep or on the out sweep. So all it's doing is articulating back and forth in this little hairspring. You can probably see it is expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. So they built out of a material that would allow, they built and designed it in a way so that it would maintain equal pressure. Then they, of course, they also modified the staffs, they modified the jewels so that everything was extremely balanced inside of the drivetrain of the watch. So when we talk about positions, we've got the five positions that are mandatory, a lot of times the manufacturers went to six positions anyways, and heat, and cold, and isochronism. And at that point in time, you had a watch, and this is where it gets real crazy. So in the end, starting in 1930, okay, there were a total of eight positions, if you include heat, cold, and isochronism, that the watch was adjusted to commonly. But the standards, the standards are where it gets real crazy. So this watch, this watch, that watch, any watch that had the approval for the railroad had to have accuracy of six seconds per 72 hours. So that's three days, guys. Three days. So over a period of three days, 72 hours, that watch, any of these watches, could not deviate more than six seconds, which is interesting. And I'm gonna get into that in a second. Um, we'll just kind of touch on it right now. Chronometer, you've heard the word chronometer. If you bought a, bought a Breitling, you bought a, if you bought a Rolex, uh, Omega, et cetera, in modern times, you'll notice you see the word chronometer. What does chronometer mean? Chronometer basically means it is, quote unquote, a laboratory grade piece of timekeeping equipment and that that watch has actually gone to an observatory. The actual movement of your watch has gone to an observatory and has been timed over a period of 15 days. And that is 
Currently, that is the standard by which all watches are judged. Okay? The standards set by the COSC for timekeeping state that on a daily basis, over the course of those 15 days, that watch cannot lose more than four seconds or gain more than six seconds. And then per day, so going from day one, two, three, four, five, per day cannot have a mean variation from day to day of more than two seconds per day from the prior day. So what does that really mean, guys? That means you actually have a window of 10 seconds per day that that watch can vary. The railroad watch was six seconds flat over 72 hours. That is a much tighter, much more stringent timekeeping um, uh, requirement than the COSC sets forth in the standard chronometer um, certification. Now, that's not to talk about Metas certification. That's a completely different thing. That is super, super, super high end. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But just to drive home, guys, think about this. In the 1860s, the 1890s, you had a watch that was capable of keeping time accurately in multiple positions. Six seconds over three days. It's absolutely incredible. And most modern wristwatches, except for the most high end of high end of high end, cannot and do not compete with that. Very interesting. So eventually, guys, the standard of having to key wind and key set the watch did go away. So when it went away, it did not go away entirely. The concept remained the same. So you had to have a watch that could be wound through the stem and crown, but it had to be lever set. If you're not familiar with what that means, I'm going to show you. Having said that, I think it's really cool. We talked about how, how nicely these had to be made, right? They had to be made in a very precise manner. But, and, and these watches, it's, it's super cool because watches from this age, this time period, they were tools, right? They were tools, they were not jewelry. But if you look at the level of refinement, right, this is all completely, completely unnecessary. This level of detail on the movement to make it beautiful. I'm just going to kind of move it a little bit so you can kind of see it shift. That is called demaskining. Okay, so this is a way to decorate a movement. And they all took such great pride in their movements that they made them all beautiful. So I'm going to grab next, I'm going to grab this Illinois. I'm going to pull it off screen for just a second. This is called the Illinois Bun Special. So just like the B.W. Raymond, this watch was named after the founder of the company. So if you look at the Illinois, it is also highly detailed. You'll notice it's got the railroad approved. You'll notice it's got many of the stampings that we talked about earlier. This particular example is from 1927. This Elgin, I believe, is 1918. We're gonna open this up. Think about that too, guys. Think about that. In 1918, 1927, whatever the year may be, they didn't have CNC machines. This is hand finishing. This is hand finishing. Absolutely beautiful. So you can see the commonality between all of these movements. You can see the jewels are, are positioned very nicely. In fact, if you look at this, you can actually see that there's little tiny screws. And when it's time to service the watch, each individual jewel can be taken out and cleaned. It's amazing. Or if a jewel was deemed to be cracked or not in the proper um, cracked or or maybe it was a problem maybe it was milled improperly this also made it very easy to pop that jewel out and replace it with another one so i wanted to share that with you guys and just show you guys how pretty these movements were it was completely unnecessary it did not need to be done they did it out of pride right so when we talked about stem set and lever set what exactly does that mean well, stem set's really easy. It's what you're accustomed to on your modern wristwatch. You pull out your stem, 
and the crown will move into a setting position and then you rotate your crown and the time sets, right? Pretty easy stuff. So check this out, right? So I can wind the watch this way, right? So I can get it a nice wind, right? But if I pull out, I can't pull out. I cannot set the time. So how do I set the time? Well, this was one of the regulations and rules of a railroad watch. It had to be what's called lever set. So we're going to remove this. So every time you want to set your watch, you had to do this. Remove the bezel and the crystal. And if you'll notice, right here, it may be difficult to see. Right here, there's a tiny lever. So when it comes to setting the watch, after we have the, the crystal and bezel removed, there's a tiny little lever. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. But every time you wanted to set your watch, you had to do this. So I'm just going to use my tweezers to pull it out there, right? So we pull this out. But really, it's designed for a fingernail. So you just take your fingernail, you pull it out. And now that it's all the way out to the setting position, check it out. Now I can set my watch. I set it to the exact time it needs to be. I press this in, boom, it's now set. I take my bezel and I rotate it back on. Now your watch is set. This is entirely so you do not accidentally change the time on your watch. Because again, it's very important. We don't want to lose cargo. We don't want to lose human lives. We don't want to disrupt the flow of goods, merchandise, and building materials through America. So this is exactly why you had stem, wind, lever, set, which replaced the key wind, key set versions of the 1890s. So we've talked about the railroad pocket watch, what makes it special. Um, what is really interesting, in fact, is that the American railroads used a pocket watch for a very, very, very long time. Um, in fact, it's interesting to note that certain industries like the aviation industry or the military complex, you know, the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, um, everybody was using wristwatches and like from like the 1930s on and the Train guys, well, they were still using their, their pocket watches. So in 1959, there was a magazine called Railway Age Magazine, okay? So in 1959, an individual wrote a letter to the editor, and he was kind of a little upset, and he said, you know, I find it, I find it kind of unbelievable that in this modern day and age, with high-quality wristwatches, that we as conductors or engineers are expected to carry a pocket watch when they're they're big, they're cumbersome, and we don't really need them because like there's good wristwatches out there, right? Well, yes and no. There was no wristwatch that was designed specifically to railroad standards. So the editor of that magazine got a hold of a um, a very influential guy in the in the watch business, um, and he forwarded that letter. Um, prior to that, he forwarded it to a number of the railroad owners, and then once he got their feedback, he forwarded on to um, a guy who was a watch designer for Elgin, and. He wrote a list of, of 10 requirements, right? He said, we're looking for a wrist watch that can serve as a replacement for the pocket watch. And our requirements are that it needs to be a 23 jewel watch. It needs to have a new balance wheel design. Um, and he gave reasons why, and it had a lot to do with, with accuracy um, and balance, um, as the name balance wheel might apply. Uh, so that was actually led to a development from Elgin called the Dura Balance Balance Wheel. Um, having said that, it also had to have an unbreakable mainspring, which they called the Dura Power Mainspring. Uh, it had to have a stainless steel case 
with an indented top and it had to be easy to wind. It had to be shockproof, meaning if you drop it, it's not going to cause uh, damage, right? So we know that it's shock resistant or Inca block or Inca flex or whatever the case may be. Um, it had to be waterproof. It had to be, it had to have a magnetic movement shield in the back of the watch. And it had to have a non-magnetic steel dial. That's number eight. Number nine, it had to be adjusted to six positions. And then 10, it had to have what's called a hacking seconds hand. And this is also a requirement of many of the military aviation watches. A hacking second hand is a second hand in which when you pull out the stem and crown, the watch stops moving. And the reason for this is because you can calibrate two watches, 50 watches, 100 watches, whatever the case may be, you can actually regulate them all to the exact second if you have a very, very accurate watch to begin with. So there it is, guys. There it is. In 1959, the market, they began testing this in the market, and in 1960, it was released. And it is called the B.W. Raymond Wrist Chronometer. Now, they called it the Wrist Chronometer. I don't think they actually had... Uh, the rights to call it a chronometer. I don't, I don't think they actually had the rights to call it a, a chronometer uh, because it was not sent to any of the, did not have COSC certification, uh, but it was definitely chronometer grade. Okay. So guys, without any further ado, here it is. The Elgin BW Raymond wrist chronometer, which was the first wristwatch ever approved by the railroads uh, for use. Um, very interesting piece of history here. Uh, there aren't a lot of them still around, primarily because they were, they were work watches, they were tool watches, and they were only available in three different references. Um, and having said that, the reference 2285 would be the most common. That would be a stainless steel only version, so truly a tool watch, a work watch. Uh, there was the 2286, which is the same watch, same dial, same everything, except for it's in a 10 karat gold filled case. It's a pretty rare watch. As you can see, this is gold. This is not the rarest. The rarest is the 2287. That is a solid 14 karat gold BW Raymond. They are exceptionally rare. If you ever find one, if you're lucky enough, buy it, hang on to it exceptionally rare. The gold filled version in itself is also incredibly rare. So if you notice, it's got many of the hallmarks that you would expect to find in the pocket watch, right? It's got the white dial. It's got the bold black hands. It has the bold numerals. And we talked about the hacking second hand. So if I wanted to calibrate this watch, or synchronize this watch to my partner's watch, I simply pull out on the crown all the way. And if you notice, it stopped moving. So he, he or she would set their watch to exactly the same time. And we would count down from three usually and say one, two, three. Simple push of the crown, it starts. So now our two watches, or five watches, or 30 watches, are all perfectly synchronized together. So very interesting, and, and I think, if I, and I could be wrong on this, but I do believe that the dial, while the original spec was that it had to be in non-magnetic steel, I think they actually created an alloy with lead in it. Um, and, and that was actually to further serve as a, uh, a magnetism deterrent. I'm going to flip this watch over so you guys can see the back of it. This one's actually highly decorated. Um, this has a very, very beautifully written inscription to somebody. This was given as a gift. Um, but as you can tell, it's um, nice gold fill on it. Very thick. Uh, the inscription is still there. That's pretty deep too. So there's a pretty heavy layer of gold on these. 
Um, the inscription is still there. I'm going to go ahead and open this watch and show you guys exactly what I'm talking about when I talked about the magnetism shield in the rear of the watch. So there we go. Well, where's the watch movement? Well, it's hidden underneath this. And I don't know what alloy they used for this, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's not steel. Um, it is steel, but it's not pure steel. Because when I got this watch, before we, before we cleaned it up and took care of it, this piece right here was black. Super black. So I have to think there's either some type of silver content in this or or something there's something in there to help with the magnetism something that they came up with because i in fact i have never had anything as tarnished as this in my life um it took it took me six polishing attempts to get the tarnish off of it and make it look like it does now, this is no big deal. It did not degrade the quality of it. It did not make it, um, it did not rust clearly, as you can see, but it just wasn't pretty. And I wanted whoever owned this watch to open it up if they wanted to and enjoy a pretty watch. So we're gonna pop off that shield. So here it comes. So there's the shield. It simply snaps in and there it is guys hopefully you guys can see that that is the uh, caliber 730 a there were two different calibers there was a 730 a and there was the 780 uh, the 780 I believe was actually a Swiss watch um, somebody can fact check me on that I might be wrong uh, but when you bought your watch, you had no idea what was in it, right? You didn't know if it was a 730A or if it was the grade 780. You just knew that it was railroad approved. So a lot of times I've had people in the past when we've had these and we've been showing them, they look at the watch and they go, oh, no, 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 no. That's not right. That's a replacement movement. And I say, well, what do you mean it's a replacement movement? Why would you say that? Well, because it's not round and it's a round watch. Well, for whatever reason, when they were doing their R&D, they found it was easier to make a completely balanced watch in this shape as opposed to a round one. So it's not like they took some off the shelf movement and just chucked it into a round case. Nope, this was a, a watch that was specifically, a movement that was specifically made for high grade um, high grade timekeeping. Now this movement, it is interesting, this movement can be found in other Elgin watches. However, they're not Elgins, they are Lord Elgins. So to the best of my knowledge, none of the 730As wound up in any Elgin watch except for the BW Raymond. They wound up in Lord Elgins. But what's interesting, if you look at the 730As that you find in the Lord Elgins, you will find that they are not marked as being adjusted in the same way that this one is. Well, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this. I wanted to share a little bit of history of railroad watches as well as um, wristwatches. So wristwatches and um, pocket watches. I, I think that this is a uh, an area that's often overshadowed a lot of people a lot of people and i think it's because of marketing a lot of people don't realize that at one point in time american wristwatches were were the, the king of the hill so to speak um they outperformed the swiss in in many different ways and we'll talk about that in in later episodes in fact actually scary fact there was a point in time during the 1860s and 1870s when the Swiss were importing fake American watches. Unbelievable. So they're actually importing fake American watches and trying to uh, label them as railroad watches and that caused some problems. It also um, basically turned into a scenario in which um, they became like a United States Customs Agency. Um, we'll talk about that in more great in greater detail in another episode but i'm just going to put this back together 
because this watch actually has a new owner. So this watch, um, they never stick around long when they're around because there are there's definitely a collector's market for these that understands exactly what it is that they're getting um, and why they're important. So congratulations if you're if you, if this is your watch. Uh, congratulations, and I hope you find this video, and I hope you uh, enjoy seeing it and enjoy learning a little bit of history about it if you didn't already know. But I have a feeling if you bought this watch, you already knew. But for the rest of you guys, thanks for joining us. Well, guys, hope you had fun. Again, I'm Steve Brown from SecondHandHorology.com. Uh, we're going to start doing more videos uh, talking about some historic timepieces, rare timepieces, Stuff that just not, you know, you don't see a lot of, right? So we're going to bring some of the more fun parts of the hobby out. We're going to talk about it. We're going to have a good time. Uh, you can find us online, of course, at our website, secondhandhorology.com. Pretty much everything you're going to see in the videos is going to make its way onto the website. Um, also, you can find us online, clearly, on YouTube. Also, uh, Instagram, under Secondhand Horology The Galleria. And also, Facebook. Uh, definitely strongly recommend checking out our, our Instagram and our Facebook because a lot of stuff hits social media way before it ever hits the website. Um, so if you want first dibs, that's the place to go. So again, thanks a lot, guys. Hope you had a good time. We'll see you next video.